In order to justify the attention I am giving to what is seemingly so specialized a subject, let me take a step back for a moment. This, after all, is only a means that I will use to take on a much more general theme, the genealogy of the modern subject. In the years that preceded the Second War, and even more so after the war, philosophy in France was dominated by what we could call the philosophy of subject. I mean that philosophy saw as its task par excellence the foundation of all knowledge and the principle of all signification as stemming from the meaningful subject. The transcendence of the ego reigned. The importance given to this question was, of course, due to the uh, impact of Husserl. Only his Cartesian meditations and the crisis were generally known in France. But the centrality of the subject was also tied to an institutional context. For the French university, since philosophy began with Descartes, it could only advance in a Cartesian manner. But we must also take into account the political conjuncture. Given the absurdity of wars, slaughters, and despotism, it seemed to be up to the individual subject to give meaning to his existential choices. With the leisure and distance that came after the war, this emphasis on the philosophical subject no longer seemed so self-evident two hitherto hidden theoretical paradoxes could no longer be avoided. One, this philosophy of consciousness paradoxically had failed to found a philosophy of knowledge and especially a philosophy of scientific knowledge. Two, this philosophy of meaning paradoxically had failed to take into account the formative mechanisms of signification and the structures of systems of meaning. I am aware that another form of thought claimed to have gone beyond the philosophy of the subject during, during the years of which I am speaking. This, of course, was Marxism. It goes without saying. But it goes better with saying. <laughs> that neither materialism nor the theory of ideologies successfully constituted the theory of objectivity and the theory of signification. Marxism put itself forward as a humanistic discourse that would replace the abstract subject with an appeal to the real man, the concrete man, desalienated, desalienation of man, and so on. It should have been clear at the time that Marxism carried with it a fundamental practical weakness the humanistic discourse hid a political reality that the Marxists of this period nonetheless supported. With the all too easy clarity of hindsight, what you Americans, I think, call the Monday morning quarterback, <laughs> let me say that there were possible paths, two possible paths, that led beyond this philosophy of the subject the theory of objective knowledge, and an analysis of systems of meaning that we could call semiology. The first of these paths was the path of logical positives. The second one was that of a certain school of linguistic psychoanalysis and anthropology, all generally grouped under the rubric of structuralism. These were not the directions I took. Let me announce once and for all that I am not a structuralist, <laughs> and I confess with the appropriate chagrin that I am not an analytical, analytic philosopher. Nobody is perfect. <laughs> I have tried to explore another direction. I have tried to get out from the philosophy of the subject through a genealogy of the subject, by studying the constitution of the subject across history, 
which has led us to the modern concept of the self. That is, that this has not always been an easy task since most of historians prefer a history of social processes where society plays the role of subject and most philosophers prefer a subject without history. This has never prevented me from using the same material than certain social historians have used, nor from recognizing my theoretical depth to those philosophers who, like Nietzsche, have posed the question of the historicity of the subject. So much for the general project. Now a few words on methodology. For this kind of research, the history of science constitutes a privileged point of view. This might paradox seem paradoxical, after all, the genealogy of the self does not take place within a field of scientific knowledge as if we were nothing else than that which rational knowledge could tell us about ourselves. While the history of science is without doubt an important testing ground for the theory of knowledge as well as for the analysis of meaningful systems, it is also fertile ground for, st for studying the genealogy of subject. There are two reasons for this. All the practices by which the subject is defined and transformed are accompanied by the formation of certain types of knowledge and in the West, for a variety of reasons, knowledge tends to be organized around forms and norms that are more or less scientific. There is also another reason, maybe more fundamental and more specific to our societies. I mean, the fact that one of the main moral obligations for any subject is to know oneself, to explore oneself, to tell the truth about oneself, and to constitute oneself as an object of knowledge, both for other people and for oneself a truth obligation for individuals, and a scientific organization of knowledge, those are the two reasons why the history of knowledge constitute a privileged point of view for the genealogy of subject. Hence it follows that I am not trying to do history of sciences in general, but only of those which sought to construct a scientific knowledge of the subject. Another consequence, I am not trying to measure the objective value of these sciences nor to know if they can become universally valid. That is the task of an epistemological historian. Rather, I am working on an history of science that is to some extent regressive, a history that seeks to discover the discursive, the institutional, and the social practices from which these sciences arose. This would be an archaeological history. Finally, a third consequence. This project seeks to discover the point at which these practices became coherent, reflective techniques with defini definite goals. The point at which a particular discourse emerged from those techniques and came to be seen as true, the point at which they are linked with the obligation of searching for the truth and telling the truth. In sum, the aim of my project is to construct a genealogy of the subject, the method is an archaeology of knowledge, and the precise domain of the analysis is what I should call technologies, I mean the articulation of certain techniques and certain kinds of discourse about the subject. I would like to add one final word about the practical significance of this form of analysis. For Heidegger, it was through an increasing obsession with techne as the only way to arrive at an, un at an un 
understanding of object that the West lost touch with being. Let's turn the question around and ask which techniques and practices form the Western concept of the subject, giving it its characteristic play of truth and error, freedom and constraint. I think that it is here where we will find the real possibility of constructing a history of what we have done and at the same time a diagnosis of what we are. This would be a theoretical analysis which has at the same time a political dimension. By this word political dimension I mean an analysis that relates to what we are willing to accept in our world, to accept, to refuse and to change both in ourselves and in our circumstances. In sum, it is a question of searching for another kind of critical philosophy. Not a critical philosophy that seeks to determine the conditions and the limits of our possible knowledge of the object, but, but a critical philosophy that seeks the conditions and the indefinite possibilities of transforming the subject, of transforming ourselves. Up to the present, I have proceeded with this general project in two ways. I have dealt with the modern theoretical constructions that were concerned with the subject in general. I have tried to analyze in a previous book theory of subject as a speaking, living, working being. I have also dealt with the, with the more practical understanding formed in those institutions like hospitals, asylums, prisons, where certain subjects became objects of knowledge and at the same time objects of domination. Now, I wish to study those forms of understanding which the subject creates about himself. Those forms of self-understanding are important, for instance, to analyze the modern experience of sexuality. But since I started with this last type of problems, I have been obliged to change my mind on several points. Let me introduce at last a kind of autocritic. 